Ernest Evans, or as I affectionately like to call it, Roy Foker in Quapplevania. Made by the Almighty Wolf Team, which you should know if you're big into RPGs. And if you don't, they went on to make literally every Tales of game ever. So you're welcome. The story follows Roy Foker in that small, not talked about period of time between the Third World War and the First Robotech War. In this time, he has a bit of a life crisis. He decides he wants to go on an adventure, similar to his hero Indiana Jones. But, he knew that there'd be too many fangirls out there if he went by his real name, so he changed it to Ernest Evans. And he knew this adventure would be far too easy for someone as cool as him. He decides to undergo an experimental operation to replace all of his bone mass with jello, so he becomes the first human invertebrate. And thus we have Ernest Evans on the Genesis. Now the first thing you'll probably notice is this game looks really wonky as balls. And ironically, the technique that ended up making this game look really, really incredibly wonky was also supposed to make it look a lot smoother. If you're familiar with something like Gunstar Heroes or Alien Soldier, you've probably already seen this. Essentially, in certain other games, developers would create a large boss sprite out of several smaller sprites interacting with one another. This in turn generally creates smoother animation with more points of articulation, working independent of each other, but at the same time making the whole a larger, intimidating, very detailed enemy. This technique was used on Ernest here, however, because he's a human, seeing the way each of his limbs moves independently of one another, and still not affected by a constant physics, is sort of uncanny valley breaking. I mean, you can recognize that a human wouldn't naturally move like that, so it just looks really wonky. But, I think the Almighty Wolf team knew this. They saw that their game already looked janky, so they decided to instead scrap the project. They were going to embrace it. They thought, if this game looks wonky, let's have fun with this. And they decided on the fly to just invent ragdoll physics. Yeah, this game, it made ragdoll physics a thing. So you're welcome, Saints Row, GTA, The Force Unleashed. Holy crap, that was a bad game. But because this is sort of the first introduction of ragdoll physics, the rest of the physics engine kind of suffers. So there's a lot of inconsistency between movement. And jumping around feels really floaty. It's very odd. In addition, Evans comes equipped with a whip which you can use to latch onto various ledges and hooks and things, sort of Castlevania style. Unfortunately, the whip doesn't always stick to what you aim it at. You have to be standing at a specific spot and you have to aim your whip in a specific way. And that's very difficult to do and even then it's kind of janky. Now while we're still on the topic of really weird things about this game, let's talk about how damage is done. Now damage, to either your character or the enemy is calculated by the hitbox of a weapon and the hurtbox of an opponent. So for every frame that a single pixel of your whip is attacking an opponent's hitbox, it'll take one damage. If you get more of your whip in your opponent's hitbox, it'll do more damage. And with the exception of one item in this game, it seems to be a constant. However, the opposite is also true. Now, while there is recoil, this actually is also a bit of a problem. See, when you get hit by a larger enemy, it pushes you back substantially more than a smaller enemy, which means you're probably not going to take too much damage from larger enemies. However, smaller enemies push you back less and tend to swarm you, which means they can be just flying all over your sprite and basically kill you instantly. Like, let's just take a look at this boss here. On the left side, you can see a bunch of really small flies, and on the right, you see this big boss I'm standing on. The boss isn't the threat, it's the little flies. If you stand on them, you're basically dead, whereas if you stand on top of the boss and just get attacked by the boss, you take virtually no damage. That's a little bit messed up. But to help even the odds, Evan gets weapons. Yes, pretty much each level has its own unique weapon, and you can only use it in that level. There's your basic whip, there's a flail, you can get Indiana Jones' hat in that one level if you can find it, and then your whip turns all neon-y, which is awesome. And then there are these little pebbles, and they're weird because they actually operate a little bit differently than the other weapons. Instead of doing one damage for every frame of overlap between hurt and hitbox, 
they do a flat out set of damage, which actually ironically makes these worthless little pebbles the most dangerous weapon in the game. How messed up is that? Also while we're talking about weapons, what the hell is this thing? What the hell is this thing? Seriously, what the hell is this thing? It's like a rock tied to a stick or something, but it just looks weird. There's also a bunch of other weird inconsistencies, such as being able to climb certain walls and ledges, despite not being able to do them on other ones that look exactly the same. It's rather odd, and it just feels like it wasn't very QA tested. Although in the end, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but we'll get to that. Now, we've already talked about how janky this game looks, but in the end, that makes it look pretty unique. I mean, I'm not going to say it looks good, because honestly, it looks really incredibly rough. But, that said, it's definitely memorable. <laughs> I'll give it that much. The soundtrack is composed by Motoi Sakuraba and is just as fantastic as I've come to expect from him over the years. The main theme song is Kick-Ass, and I think with the exception of a few added cutscenes, the only difference between the North American Genesis version and the Japanese Mega CD version was the use of instrumental soundtrack. And I've actually listened to both, and I honestly think I prefer the Genesis version. There's something about that just Genesis power that you can feel behind that soundtrack that just makes it feel a little more powerful than just instruments. I don't know, maybe it's just me. This game is very difficult. In between the bugs, that is both the enemies and computer ones, the enemies and stage design are very difficult. There's tons of traps which you really do have to keep your eye out for, because in the end you can easily die due to a trap, but if you're paying attention, you'll generally be okay. And if you keep your ear to the ground, you can find stuff that'll make you live a lot longer. And I think that definitely captures the spirit of true adventure. And now we come to the part where I tell you whether you should get this game or not. And after watching the majority of this review, I'm sure you know what I'm about to say. You absolutely have to get this game, it's awesome. Okay, yeah, it looks really, really awkward and janky. And it is, but honestly this game is incredibly fun to play. I think everyone with a Genesis needs to have Ernest Evans in their collection. And I don't mean that in the sarcastic, douchey, asshole way of Oh, you have to get this game just so you know how bad it is. No, this game is legitimately awesome. Granted, I might be the only person in the world who can see that, but I still say grab Ernest Evans, it's dirt cheap, and it's a ton of fun. And hopefully by this point, the Namco Tales team have reformed Wolf Team after watching this review, and are working on Ernest Evans 2. Stomping on Minmei with Veritech Fighters Boogaloo. Starring, of course, Dan Warren, as Roy Foker, as Ernest Evans. Well, a guy can hope, can't he?